You might not realize it, but mathematics can unlock incredible power. You can use it to make your dreams become reality. Mathematics is a powerful tool for exploring life on Earth and for discovering our place in the universe. Mathematics is changing the way we play our games, the way we think about ourselves. It's the fuel that's driving the information age. This is mathematics like you've never seen it before. Major funding for this program comes from the National Science Foundation. America's investment in the future. And the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to increase understanding of the application of mathematics in everyday life. Additional funding provided by the McDonnell Douglas Foundation and the Alcoa Foundation with exclusive corporate support from Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is proud to partner with the education community to create the calculators that help children do extraordinary things. Because the more our children can get out of math and science, the more they'll get out of life. Imagine this. You sign up for a class to learn construction work. The teacher shows you a hammer, a screwdriver, a wrench. For months, the teacher lectures, and for months, you take careful notes. The hammer is made of wood and steel. A screwdriver's handle is molded plastic, and a wrench is 10 inches long. At the end of the course, you might know a lot of facts about the tools, but you still wouldn't know how to use them, would you? No. And you might be thinking, that doesn't make any sense. Why would anyone teach you what the tools are without helping you learn how to use them? It's a good question, and it's exactly how mathematics has been taught in this country for decades. Students memorize symbols and formulas, but they aren't taught the concepts that lie at the heart of mathematics. In short, we've been teaching the tools, but not helping the students learn how to use them. I know some of you are hearing this, and it's bringing on an acute case of nerves, the kind you felt back in high school math class when you prayed the teacher wouldn't call on you because you're just no good at math. But I feel pretty confident that we can calm those nerves in the next hour. And so do plenty of people who are working to reform the way mathematics is taught in our schools. All around the country, dynamic educators and innovative professionals are finding a way to make math make sense. Who knows? In the next 60 minutes, you might just discover that you really are pretty good in math. And why shouldn't you be? After all, you've had the tools all along. Once upon a time, folks looked around and noticed that in this world, certain patterns existed. They invented a language of numbers, shapes, and symbols to describe the patterns, and the language became known as mathematics. The great thinkers of the time taught us how to use mathematics to navigate ships, build homes, do business, fight wars. We learned the language of mathematics because we could see how it related directly to our own well-being, our progress, our prosperity. 
Now, skip forward a few thousand years. Math moved into the classroom, and it took the form of drills, worksheets, memorizing formulas, taking tests. Parents weren't happy. They were complaining. They weren't satisfied with what was happening with their children. And the students themselves, over and over again, in mathematics classes across the country, the kids were asking that question that teachers themselves were having a difficult time responding to. What good is all this stuff? Why am I learning this? What am I going to do with it? Students couldn't see how the language of mathematics represented the world around them. And they found this frustrating. If you shake your head at me, I'm going to sock you one. Oh, come on, Tom. Do you want me to help you or don't you? Sure I do. But what gets me so mad is that I never used to have any trouble in arithmetic. Mathematics, it seemed, had an image problem. Test scores plummeted nationally. Fewer students pursued math careers. Popular icons were bad-mouthing mathematics. Math class is tough. Math, math, math class is tough. Ha, 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 ha. In a world that depended on technology, experts feared our students couldn't compete unless things changed. But changed how? Redesigning the way math is taught is kind of like redesigning the 747 in flight. By the 1980s, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics created three documents to help schools evaluate math curriculum and measure success. The documents came to be known simply as the standards. What they are is a big set of goals, principles, standards, big statements that will help us to think about what's happening in our program. It doesn't mean that there's one vision. You can walk in six different classrooms and see different structures, different ways in which students and teachers are interacting, and yet have students in all six of those classrooms learning mathematics to levels and in ways that are much more powerful than what we've done in the past. Let's go for it. It's hitting the y-axis. Okay, three lines of five, which is 15. Very good. So can you draw it? Um, we experimented with the amplitude. How far you pull it back? The standards are young. We've been at this just a few years, but we are already seeing wonderful pockets of excellence across the country. Is there room in our country for a math revolution? Some say no. And the others? Well, for others, the revolution has already begun. start with the pop quiz. These students at Philadelphia Central High School are in A, an English class. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some 30 or 40 feet overhead and constructed much as a sidewalk. B, the students are in a physics class. It depends on what angle you drop it from. I mean, if you drop it from up here, it's going to swing higher up here. But if you drop it from like an angle like this, or C, the students are in an arts and crafts class. Actually, it was a trick question. These students are in math class. To be exact, they're in a math class called IMP, an acronym for Interactive Math Program. The curriculum has been in development since 1989. Today, about 35,000 students take IMP courses in over 200 high schools nationwide. The heart of M philosophy is to teach math through problems plucked from literature, science, and everyday situations. What IMP tries to do is to teach everything in context. 
all too often in the traditional mode of teaching, the students passively sit in rows and receive the teacher's knowledge, and the teacher's having all the fun at the board. Question number three. IMP is an altogether different way of looking at the classroom, that whereas the traditional way is what you might call teacher-centered, IMP is student-centered. We make the students the stars of the class. All right, stop it. All right, we need a protractor. Right from the very beginning of IMP 1, we encourage students to try all kinds of different approaches, and we value and we applaud any way that students use to get correct answers. Research has shown that when you do something on your own, when you construct it for yourself, it's going to be more meaningful to you, you're going to remember it longer. The emphasis on the IMP classroom is on the mathematical process, not just a correct answer. Teachers chart the students' progress by reviewing journals and portfolios of their work. Each unit has a central theme, but there's lots of different math in the unit. Unlike a traditional program where you might spend all of ninth grade doing algebra and all of 10th grade doing geometry, it integrates many different math topics into a single unit. But by senior year, our students were solving enormously complicated and intricate problems that other students simply couldn't approach. It all starts in the freshman year of the interactive math program, where students solve a problem based on the Edgar Allan Poe short story, The Pit and the Pendulum. Could I get a volunteer to read for us? The prisoner is in some kind of dungeon. He looks up and he realizes that there's a pendulum swinging back and forth over his head. Then to his horror, he realizes two things. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had perceptively descended. I now, I now observed with, with what horror it is needless to say that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel about a foot in length from horn to horn. The prisoner makes some quick calculations and determines that the pendulum is 30 feet long. He also computes that he has about 12 swings of the pendulum to execute his escape. That is, to let the dungeon rats chew through the ropes before the blade cuts him in half. At this point, we pose to the students the unit question. How long would it take a 30-foot pendulum to make 12 complete swings? In other words, is it feasible that the prisoner would have time to execute his plan and escape? The students on the second day of class come into class with little models of pendulums that they have made the night before, which means let's let the students relate to this. Let's let them build stuff, some hands-on stuff, so they're really feeling part of this problem. As we go down. I, I left my pendulum at home, so this morning I had to improvise, and I used my gym shoe, and, and I, I used a piece of gimp and my gym shoe to make my pendulum. The next step is to start experimenting. Just what factors affect the time it takes for the pendulum to swing back and forth? In typical imp style, the teachers let the students discover the data on their own. Um, we experimented with the amplitude, like how far you pull it back. We measured the periods with different weights. We decided on different lengths of string. The students don't realize it, but they're actually using a tool for evaluating data called inferential statistics. As they perfect their experiments, they chart their findings on a graph, the basis for a lesson about standard deviation. By plotting points, the students find that the only factor showing a great deviation is the length of the pendulum's rope. Armed with this information, they come up with an algebraic equation to solve the problem. They make their prediction. We then go down to the gymnasium so that, again, according to M-Style, they can see for real whether this worked. They time it back and forth, and they usually get very excited to see how accurate their predictions were. So, did the prisoner really have enough time to escape? It depends on how fast the rats could eat through the ropes. As these students discovered, the time it takes for a 30-foot pendulum to swing back and forth 12 times is 70 seconds. All 
all kids always ask to have a fun class and group work and, and you learn. And IMP is the one chance that we actually get to do that. We're, we're having fun and we're learning and it's great. I was told when I was younger that I was a failure at math. Let's see, but I have done well in IMP. I think it's better because you don't have to always rely on a teacher like to explain stuff. You can just ask your peers the answer and they will explain it more than sometimes teachers would do. It was like so, so good for me just to be able to have a course where I could do both math and write at the same time. I mean, it really helped me. My English grades went from a C in my freshman year to getting A's now. So, I mean, for me, it's a writing course and a math course at the same time. I think that IMP teaches you not only math, but it also teaches you how to learn math. Okay, you have to have some thoughts about what you think affects the period of the pendulum. If they're going to really understand the math, they have to be able to verbalize it. The students have more freedom to talk. I mean, it's a noisier classroom, the IMP classroom. But um, you do have more control because you're standing back and you're watching what's happening. You're more aware of what's going on in the classroom. What's going on in this senior classroom is the start of a new six-week unit called High Dive. Students figure out when a diver should leap off a Ferris wheel in order to land in a tub of water below. The problem is, is that the tub of water is situated on a moving cart. A field of mathematics that's included in nearly every high school curriculum is that of trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent, etc. These are called circular functions because they are derived from circles. So that instead of simply saying, what would the x and y coordinate of a point be at this angle on this circle, we can instead say, listen, we're trying to figure out when this guy should jump. And part of that is to figure out how high off the ground will he be at certain times and how far to the left or right of the center of the Ferris wheel will he be at certain times. So a lot of trigonometry, a lot of work with quadratic equations, a lot of physics came together. And another thing that came together, this was the first time in many of the students' experiences that they were able to put together a huge, monstrous, complex, impressive equation that absolutely could not be solved unless you used a calculator or a computer. The calculators are a great opportunity for us. We can have students use the calculators to do the messy computational part and then leave it up to the students to do the exciting part, the part where they interpret the graphs, the part where they say, what does all of this mean? And also, of course, the part where you figure out what to put into the calculator. This side of the equation is the, um, the whole thing represents where the diver is going to end up. And the whole side over there represents where the cart is going to end up. And you basically want them to be in the same place at the same time because we want them to land in the water. So that's why they're equal. So the time plus the time in the air times the rate plus, uh, um, plus a negative 240 gives the position of the cart when the diver is released. Y2 is the variable C. And these two right here are the velocities of x and y because one's negative and one's positive. One of the questions that, that parents and students and other educators have is whether IMP prepare students for standardized tests such as SATs. What we have found is that IMP students on the SATs do as well or better than traditional students. A lot of people who have a feeling that math is bad, it, it comes from negative experiences that they had back in the classroom. I think what we have to do is to provide people with positive experiences. I think that IMP has given me more of a reality-based education in math. And now I, you know, I know what real math is all about. <laughs>